All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Good afternoon and welcome to today's JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. Today we'll be having a much needed discussion on the long-standing history of racism, misunderstanding, and violence against the Asian American Pacific Islander community. April is also Sexual Harassment and Sexual Awareness Month. And today's forum guest has worked, has worked, uh, has done ground, groundbreaking work to ensure victims' rights. My name is Stephanie Lin, and I am a first year at the college, jointly studying economics and government with a minor in East Asian studies. And I'm currently living in Strauss and Harvard Yard, which is where I'm zooming in from today. In light of the recent surge in anti-Asian sentiments with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Asian American businesses have suffered losses, threats, and vandalizations. And members of the community, including the elderly, have endured violent and debilitating attacks, sometimes in broad daylight, as hate crimes surge in our towns and cities. It is imperative that we understand these recent incidents as part of a very long systemic cultural discrimination against Asians in this country, one which requires a national reckoning of the AAPI experience and reform, starting with the anti-Asian rhetoric that has permeated even our highest political offices, alongside the lack of sufficient consequence enforcement and national response that have emboldened perpetrators of anti-Asian hate. We are pleased to host an interview and discussion on combating anti-Asian hate and giving voice to members of the community in order to champion Asian American pride and the protection of Asian American civil rights. It is an honor to present our guest today. Amanda Noyan is an internationally acclaimed social entrepreneur. She was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 2019 Recently, her viral, viral video sparked national coverage on anti-Asian hate crimes. Over 11.4 million people initially responded. Instagram then pushed her message to 387 million followers, and Amanda's video has since been mentioned by the White House uh, press corps. In addition, Amanda also penned her own civil rights into existence by unanimously passing the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. She has trained hundreds of activists using her theory of organizing, hoponomics, to pass 3-3 laws protecting more than 85 million sexual violence survivors. Amanda is a CEO and founder of RISE, a social movement accelerator where she teaches grassroots organizing. In recognition of her work, Amanda is a highest laureate, Nelson Mandela Changemaker, Forbes 30 under 30, Foreign Policy 100, Time 100 Next, Frederick Douglass 100, and Marie Claire Young Women of the Year. Previously, Amanda served at NASA in the state department under the Obama, Obama administration. Amanda graduated from Harvard, and during her time at Harvard, she actively engaged in several IOP programs, including the Forum Committee, where she was instrumental in planning events. We're also proud to have Weijia Jiang interview Amanda at today's discussion. Weijia is CBS News' senior White House correspondent based in Washington, D.C. Jiang's reporting is featured across all CBS news broadcasts and platforms, including the CBS Evening News of Nora O'Donnell, CBS This Morning, and CBSN. Zhang has traveled with President Obama on numerous occasions, both domestically and abroad. She has covered major stories for the network, including the president's impeachments, the 2020 presidential campaign and election, and the confirmation of judges Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Conant Barrett to the, to the Supreme Court. During her coverage of the Trump administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the answers to her questions during press briefings often received widespread national attention. Prior to, prior to that, 20, in 2012, Jiang was inducted into the prestigious professional gallery at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. Jiang has also reported extensively on the Obama administration, the 2016 presidential campaign and election, and the fun funeral of former First Lady Bar Barbara Bush, and the congressional baseball shooting that wounded Representative Whip Steve Scalise. She has also covered a number of national stories, such as Hurricane Harvey in 2017. She is an active member of the Asian American Journalists Association. We're thrilled and honored to have you two with us today. Thank you, and I hope you all enjoy today's discussion. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today for this um, incredibly important conversation with Amanda, who, um, you know, I remind often was really responsible for sparking the conversation to begin with. Um, I remember being a consumer of Instagram and Twitter just on a, on a weekend like everybody else outside of work, outside of my capacity as a journalist when I saw many of the people I followed posting 
um, this video featuring Amanda, who was simply speaking in a very genuine and empathetic way to demand attention on what was happening. And at that point, I think people didn't understand, people didn't realize what was happening in the AAPI community. And Amanda um, put it very bluntly and said, you know, that we are not going to be invisible, that this is happening. And she tagged a lot of high profile journalists. So Amanda, I just want to start there um, because I wonder what motivated you to put that video together and uh, what your reaction was when you saw the response. Yeah, Ouija, I am so grateful for your time. I'm so grateful for everyone who's tuning in today and big thank you to the Harvard IOP. Um, it is very full circle for me to be back here. I was once a student helping to put on these events. And so I, I'm so glad that we're able to have this dialogue today, especially about something that I, I was gonna say near and dear to my heart, but really it's, um, it's existential. I can't erase the color of my skin. So thank you so much um, for having this dialogue. Um, quite simply, I was so done being invisible and there was so much grief that had been building. Of course, the grief started really upticking with the start of the pandemic. One of the stories I read was about in March, 2020, a two-year-old and a six-year-old stabbed in a grocery store and that the perpetrator confessed. It confesses even um, a euphemism. He straight up admitted that he stabbed uh, these, these babies because he thought they were Chinese, they were Burmese, and that he wanted to save everybody else from COVID. And that was so painful to see. Uh, and as the news stories on these blog sites kept trickling in of blatant direct racism, I tried to find out more information about it. The February video that I did was um, an amalgamation of all of that, of course, with life experiences, but also within a span of seven days, there was a murder that happened. That's Vich's death. Then there was um, uh, a Vietnamese grandmother that was attacked and a Filipino man who had his face slashed on a subway. And it happened so sequentially um, in such a short amount of time that when I tried to find out more about it, I thought this is a pattern um, and why aren't people talking about it? And that's why I turned on my camera and said, you know what, if folks aren't gonna do this, I'm gonna ask them to. And I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone who's responded. I remember um, uh, it might have been a day or two after the video went viral. I was, I had an opportunity to ask the White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, about your video. And she responded um, and said that, you know, President Biden was well aware of the racism against Asian Americans and that he was committed. But it would be a little bit after that when um, we heard President Biden from the presidential podium um, in the second week of March, condemning the attacks during a primetime address, his first primetime address. And what struck me was um, he said, our fellow Americans, and he reminded people that, you know, Asian Americans are our fellow Americans that need protection right now. Do you remember watching that speech and watching him um, acknowledge what was happening and, and what did that mean for you knowing that you had a role in you know bringing this story to the national stage? Honestly it was I was waiting right waiting with bated breath because our community was and is still being slaughtered on the streets. That is not an exaggeration, especially with the massacre that has happened. And although his speech was before that um, Atlanta shooting, I, I was waiting to hear it. And, and it felt, although I had expected of 
the president of our country to address it. When he did, I, I felt seen, you know, it, it, it in part was like, okay, finally someone is saying it, but the, the majority of what I felt was thank goodness. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was gratitude, but I have to say my my biggest feeling of gratitude is actually towards you, Ouija. Um, and it's because looking at the White House press corps, looking at that room, you know, uh, you represent me. <laughs> you represent, um, you know, so many people, even though that's not your official capacity, you know, and, um, and I, I wonder, right, like if, you weren't there, would anybody else have asked the, these questions? Um, and I, I just wanna say, I'm so grateful for you. One thing that did happen when President Biden um, talked and addressed uh, AAPI hate crimes um, and racism and violence was that his speechwriter texted me um, and shared that, in fact, it, it was in part because of the video that he included it in, um, in his speech. And so uh, without you, I don't know if the president would have seen it, um, but I am so grateful uh, to you, um, to everybody who has helped us speak this issue into the consciousness of this country. Thank you so much for saying that. I think that as journalists, sometimes we are so um, concerned about this idea of objectivity that we forget we are subjective people and that we have diversity in a newsroom for a reason. And it's not so we all look different from each other. It's so we can bring our perspective and lend a voice to those who can't be in the room, who have questions about what you know their government is doing to protect them. So thank you so much for saying that. Um, I wonder what you have observed in the media since your video went viral. I have seen, so many stories and such an outpouring of um, almost a, a appetite, a, a new appetite from news consumers who want to learn more and who want to know what's happening. Um, so can you share with what you've seen in terms of the coverage since you demanded it? And also whether you have any concerns that, um, you know, this might be just part of the news cycle and that it is dwindling. I feel a little bit like Sisyphus rolling the boulder up, um, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad that these stories are getting covered. It's the first step towards a very long journey of reconciliation of what it means for people who hold power, power brokers. In this case, the power is in defining the narrative of what it means to be an American in telling our stories in the news, in telling our stories in Hollywood, in literally defining what it means to exist in America. There was a study in 2009 that showed that some federal agencies don't even include Asians in their definition of racial minorities. That is really outrageous. And of course, uh, in our education system. Um, I have observed to your question about trends that at first, I, I, I do think that we are living in an attention economy. And so the first people that, you know, um, the, the journalists went out to, many of them, um, had huge platforms who were talking about this, right? They're celebrities. Um, and I think that is very important to have people who have huge networks of distribution on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Um, I'm really glad now to see that there are people like Professor uh, Russell uh, Jung, um, like mm -hmm. Helen Zia. Of course, they've always been there, um, and uh, there were outlets who co you know covered them, asked them to come on and speak. But um, they are getting uh, an elevated platform now, um, and I'm really, really glad that their work is being spotlighted. Unfortunately, there's still more work to do because these attacks continue to happen. And I say that that it is so disheartening to see that it, it feels like almost every day somewhere in the country, there's another a video to show what's happening. And then you wonder about all the ones that are not caught on camera. Um, and I wonder why you 
think we're here? What got us here? I, the Morning Consult just published a new poll that showed 83% of Asian Americans say AAPIs have faced more discrimination over the past year when the pandemic started. We know that's why Stop um, Hey AAPI was even founded to start tracking all of these. And I can just say anecdotally, every person I've interviewed, every victim, every victim's loved one, every lawmaker has mentioned the rhetoric around the pandemic and that those words um, in their belief really led to what we're seeing now. And I wonder if you agree with that, that, um, you know, the language used to describe their rhetoric is one reason why we're seeing it play out on the streets. A thousand percent. It's, it's calling a spade a spade. You know, it, undoubtedly leadership matters, especially when it comes from the top. And when there are phrases, racially charged phrases, slurs, when you skip go a group of people, this is what happens. Violence happens. It's the consequence of it. And it's, of course, spiked during a pandemic because during this moment of crisis, the AAPI community has been blamed, has been scapegoated. But this has lasted much longer than just the start of the pandemic. Um, ever since APIs have stepped foot into America, there have been xenophobic and racist dialogue, literal laws passed, the Chinese Exclusion Act, to name one. Um, and it has been a systematic part of the American experience for Asians. The true root for me, in my opinion, is the erasure of our humanity. It's invisibility. And it has been systematic on all of the levels that I've mentioned before, Hollywood, media, our education system, our federal government, all of these things have structures in place that again, help define what we are as a country, the narrative we tell ourselves, the promise of you know the America. And if you want to take power away from people, make them forget their collective power, make them forget their history. Don't teach it, right? And, and that is in part a large reason why we are here um, where we are now with the API community. I'm so glad you mentioned that because, you know, I, I think a lot of people are learning what the Chinese Exclusion Act even is for the very first time as a result of what we've seen in the past few weeks. Um, and I wonder if the Department of Education has to do more to incorporate Asian American studies into the curriculum from coast to coast, because I grew up in West Virginia and I certainly did not learn about what is essentially the first immigration ban that this country ever implemented. And it was against Chinese Americans. Um, there are so many other examples too of missed opportunities perhaps to teach the history of Asian Americans and therefore that might be part of the current problem that we're seeing. What do you think about um, that education piece and what can be done about it? I absolutely think that's the heart and a good first step. Empathy is the solution here and stories education, these are the, the tools to help further empathy. You know, I didn't know that the KKK had organized um, campaigns to tear down the Vietnamese American community in Louisiana. I had no idea. I found that out on um, like a Netflix cooking show, right? Mm -hmm. Why is my history not being taught to me? You know, I, I think another critical part about um, omitting history, erasing history, is the cross solidarity between communities. For instance, the Black community and the Asian community, and specifically, I'm going to reference New Orleans, it was the Vietnamese community there, worked together to, after post-hurricane, um, uh, rebuild um, uh, their communities. And, um, you know, all of our 
not only grief, but also our excellence, the fact that we work together, the fact that we have um, been able to accomplish things, all of that is erased, right? So we have to keep essentially reinventing the wheel every single time. Of course, if you do that, (laughs) then um, you're not going to be uh, as ahead as you could be. And, you know, this is not a problem that only the AAPI community can solve alone, to your point. And I know I have friends, I have colleagues who are white and, and who are black and who come from different communities and they want to know, what can I do? What can I do to help make progress and to help the AAPI community? What would you tell people who are not members per se, but are just as eager to help um, to help implement some sort of reform and changes to make things better? I'll start with a feeling, and that is I was in a live interview when the breaking news happened about the Atlanta massacre. And it was like a scene out of a movie because, um, you know, there was a reporter asking me why it is so important to speak up about this issue, the very question that you just posed. And then she said, I'm so sorry, we have breaking news. There's been um, a mass shooting targeting Asian women. Two are confirmed dead, no four, no six. Um, And without missing a beat, she asked me, in light of these deaths, do you still think there's progress? And I think for a moment, I must have switched into autopilot because I was stunned and shocked. For weeks, which has felt like, honestly, decades, I had been bearing my soul out to the nation, warning of the consequence of lack of allyship. And it was the worst form of validation the worst form of having that consequence realized. And so what I wanna say is we need you now and we need you more than ever. And that it is so, so important that you understand your individual power to shape what we call a country because what is a country other than people coming together and deciding what their principles are. And in fact, we have already had conversations about what we aspire to, the promise of America. And so wake up and and choose, choose what kind of future you wanna live in and choose what kind of human you wanna be. There are steps to do that. So now everyone doesn't have to be a full-fledged, you know, activist and go out in the streets and protest. If you have the capacity to, then thank you. Um, but it's okay to start off small, educating yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, trying your best to create that empathy. And to do that, you can watch our movies, you can support Asian businesses uh, who are suffering. Um, you can uh, go and uh, read. There are resources, plenty of them. Um, on top of that, reach out to the AAPI friends um, that you have in your life and ju- just acknowledge that. I think a lot of people may be scared they won't say the right thing just by mm-hmm. purely starting off with, hey, I can't begin to understand what you're going through, but I want to let you know that I'm here for you. What can I do for you? Um, those are some things to start. And that's going back to the humanity that you were talking about and the empathy um, that really is at the core of of what you've been talking about for so long now. You brought up the Atlanta shootings and I'm glad you did because I wanted to get there anyway because what struck me was hearing from the spokesperson for the Sheriff's Department. And I think his comments are now infamous um, because he, he seemed to empathize with the suspect, with the man who had just admitted to gunning down eight people. Um, And he said he was having a bad day and this is what he did as a result. And he also said, the, the suspect says, this is not racially motivated. He 
says this was because he had a sexual addiction and he wanted to eliminate the temptation. And, you know, I'm sure you felt the same way as me as an Asian woman, immediately thinking, wow, that there is a lot to unpack there. And I think it's an uncomfortable conversation, but if we could just, if you could unpack some of that for people who might not understand why you cannot separate this racism from the sexism that the police officer was, you know, using as a reason why this happened. Yeah, time and time again, the AAPI experience is one of fighting for validity, fighting for our trauma to be seen. And um, it's an experience of being gaslit as, uh, as a human in this country. And it was on full display. It was on full display. Um, that that empathy was given towards the person who had massacred eight people rather than to the victims and their families. And I, I, I agree with you, Ouija. I think every single Asian um, woman friend that I had texted me right after saying, a lot of things because <laughs> a lot of things um, we can't say right now <laughs> yeah, yes. because living in this body identifying as female I can say that yellow fever is very real yellow fever refers to um, the idea that uh, people can have a sexual preference for Asian females but that that sexual preference is um, underlined with the objectification um, of uh, our bodies um, that has been reinforced within Hollywood stereotypes of being docile, submissive, um, and all of these things contribute to violence. When the perpetrator uh, said that he had a sex addiction, that's, uh, that's an admission to me. That's him admitting that, at least in my mind, yellow fever. <laughs> um, I know that's not like technically what happened, but it, my mind went immediately there because Asian women have had to deal with this for so mm -hmm. long. Um, I work at the intersection of sexual violence and racism. And I can say uh, that that absolutely is the result of if not just straight up bias, certainly unconscious bias, which has been threaded through so many things, um, including when the police had said, you know, oh, he was just having a bad day, right? Um, and to take it a little further, uh, one of the most painful things was when I think the internet dug up that this police officer had in fact promoted um, a racist t-shirt. I think it said uh, something around the China virus. Mm -hmm. um, and when I found that out, it really, it, it really stood out to me as, oh, this system really isn't here for it. Cause that's end to end, like state sanctioned, literally state sanctioned um, racism where you have the words from a former head of state of our country um, saying these slurs and that the end of it is the person who's supposed to take care of, both of these people are supposed to serve us and yet they are the ones perpetrating um, these racial, uh, racially charged words. Um, it made me feel like, oh, well, do we really belong? Is this country really for us? Are we really Americans here? Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was incredibly painful. Um, yes, it was uh, for so many people because um, again, the, our, our lived experience as Asian women, um, and even though they might be microaggressions, it is something that I have experienced my whole life 
um, what would you say to people who do continue to make jokes and think it's no big deal um, when someone says something as, you know, um, what they think is innocent as, you know, uh, he, he only loves Asian girls. And um, I'm sure you've heard many of, of similar comments about um, almost fetishizing Asian women. How do you explain to somebody that this is, racist in addition to being sexist? Yeah, even though it's uncomfortable, I think being able to just say that, which is, you know, there's actually um, a really charged history behind words like that. And I know you didn't mean it that way, but, Mm -hmm. you know, please stop doing that. Here are some resources for you to read up on about this. you know, I, I think, look, we're all human. People do make mistakes. However, um, uh, uh, reparate, you know, being able to have a full apology is working on something. Um, and I, I think it is important to have these conversations. I, one of the most innocent questions that I often get, which is hurtful, is where are you from? No, really, where are you really from? After I've said, oh, you know, I'm from California. And, um, people don't realize that at the root of that question is this xenophobic idea that you do not belong. You know, and there have been plenty of comedians who have flipped that script around, where if it was an Asian person asking somebody else, and you know, they're like, oh, I'm from you know, New York. And they're like, no, no, no. Like, where specifically? are you from, you know, and it it just seems so topsy-turvy when you turn it around, right? Because it is, the concept is topsy-turvy. So my biggest thing is to listen to API people, listen to what it is that um, they're experiencing and what it is that they're asking you to do. And you had such a clear vision with Hopenomics to sort of lay out the vision for what steps we can do to Um, move forward. And I wonder what your vision is um, to really turn the page on the discrimination and the racism that we continue to see in the community. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, (laughs) For folks who don't know, Hopenomics is my theory on grassroots organizing. Um, But really at the the core of it, now it got really... um, The tagline uh, used to be hope is contagious. That's not a thing anymore (laughs) So, because we're in a pandemic. So it's hope is a renewable resource. The the difference between a dream and a hope for me is that with a dream, uh, you can, well, dream anything. Hope must be rooted in reality. It means you must have a plan. Um, And uh, truly for me at this moment, I think it's so important that APIs are visible, that we are treated as um, brothers and sisters, as neighbors, as part of this community, as part of this country. And in order to do that, we need to tell our own stories, um, you know, rather than having other community members um, tell it for us, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, that's different from other people passing that mic, right? But I don't believe in being a voice with a voiceless. We have a voice. Um, please elevate it. Uh, you know, um, pass pass that mic <laughs> to us. Um, I'm so grateful for people who have started to do that. You know, that video, by the way, in February would not have gone viral had it not been for people like Questlove, um, Amy Schumer, Lena Hetty, Haley Bieber reposting it. Mm-hmm. Right, and so um, I, I'm so grateful to uh, to them and to so many others who are not within the API community who said, you know what, I'm I'm going to stand with the API community. We are where we are right now because people decided to care. And now that you know, so much awareness has been raised about what's happening in the community. Um, do you think that's enough to change? the misinformation and misconceptions about, you know, COVID-19 and how that has had a role um, in what is happening. Because I say that because, you know, 
from my perspective, it appears that people have this misplaced anger um, and therefore they are taking it out on AAPI members. And they have this misplaced anger because they believe that somehow we brought this virus to the country uh, or perhaps Asian Americans are more likely to spread it or for whatever reason, this anger um, is, is held and then turns into uh, violence. And so because that sort of misinformation came from the top levels of government, do you think that raising awareness about the consequences is going to change this mis, you know, perception really of, of our role in the pandemic? We're starting to see it change. We are in an inflection point um, where I do think finally we're going through a moment of reckoning. We've already lost lives to this racism, to this very specific racism, blaming a pandemic on a community, our community. And while those lives cannot be resurrected, we can honor their memory and move forward by making sure that it doesn't happen again. How can we live up to the better angels of our nature? How can we not fall and, and be bystanders? And one of the most painful videos that came out recently was um, an attack. And uh, on camera, there were, there were two crimes that happened, at least in my opinion. One is not only the violence against this Asian woman who was beaten to the ground, but second were the bystanders who stood by and did nothing. It was actually more painful for me to watch those bystanders look at this woman be beaten to the ground and close the door on her. And that's a choice. That's a choice that they made. Uh, and we all, we all have agency. We all have the choice to shape our reality. And so um, people who are listening in today, again, I, I want you to know that you have incredible power to help us in this inflection point, create more progress. And although these stories are starting to get more coverage, which means more pain, I do think that it is a sign of starting a path of healing because the first part of, of healing is recognizing that there is a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, that video was so hard to watch. Those security guards, by the way, have been fired. Um, and I, I, I think for a lot of people who I talked to, you know, they felt like it was a physical manifestation of the invisibility that they yes. feel. And you're literally watching somebody ignoring um, this 65 year old woman who needs help. Um, so we are going to turn to Q&A, but before that, I just have one more question because um, I imagine a lot of um, members of our audience today are, you know, members of the AAPI community. And I feel for the younger generation and the current students um, who might be grappling with, uh, you know, this pain and wondering how their classmates view them or how, you know, people, their future employers might view them because they do feel this sense of otherness that you and I have both felt and talked about before. What advice do you have for um, the current students or anyone really who is feeling a sense of um, frustration and hopelessness because of uh, what they're seeing? That's a great question. Um, I just wanna let you know that you're not alone. I, I, I know. I know how painful it is and it is a, uh, an added layer of pain when it's not even recognized, when people don't understand and it's not fair. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for that. I want to let you know that it does get better and I don't want you to feel guilty if you're still doing a cost benefit analysis of survival. 
Because I know that for so many of us, especially from you know, immigrant backgrounds, my parents were boat refugees from Vietnam. A lot of people felt like they had to pay an American tax. This idea that you know, just by being here, um, we couldn't speak up. We, we just had to keep our heads down. Um, and so I, I want to release you of that shame if you feel the tension between having to survive and not knowing if you know, you're going to lose your job offer, you're going to lose your financial security, you can't support your parent, whatever it is. Right? Um, but I also want to let you know that you deserve to have a voice, that if you choose that your peace will, will be greater if you speak up, if that is your ultimate choice. Right. Then then know that um, you are so powerful. You are so powerful. Uh, and um, we're we're here to help. That is a great reminder. Um, and I, I hope that um, people listen to that, including Julia, who is our first student who does have a question for you. She's going to kick off our Q&A. So, Julia. If you want to ask um, your question, go ahead. Great. Hi. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm Julia, a first year at the college. And I guess one question I was wondering is I saw a lot of your work and it's amazing to see the work you do for victims' rights with the UN. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience and sort of what you see as the next step in enhancing the quality of life um, for victims, both in the AAPI community and victims in general. Thank you for your question, Julia. Um, on the United Nations front, we are currently getting the world to recognize the full dignity of survivors of sexual violence. Um, there are 1.3 billion rape survivors in the world. That's a World Health Organization statistic. That's actually from 2010, so even 10 years outdated. Um, however, uh, even so, um, the United Nations General Assembly has never passed a resolution solely focused on rape before. Surprising or unsurprising, depending on how you look at it. So um, what we're fighting for is to have the United Nations world leaders recognize that this must be an issue that is talked about. Rape has been talked about as a subcategory of other issues, for instance, weapons of war um, or a violence against women. But of course, um, men, boys, non-binary individuals are also impacted by sexual violence. And so we are, we are fighting for the issue to be uh, fully recognized in and of itself. Um, the thing that I, I wish uh, for all folks struggling, if they have experienced sexual violence and or have been um, subjugated to racism is joy, that they're able to heal mental health, wellness, that you know, for me, joy is the most radical form of rebellion, right? And which is why, um, in Ouija, your, your previous question, uh, addressing API folks, um, just know that your peace is the most valuable thing. Next, we will go to Ryan, who is also a student at Harvard College. All right, uh, thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. Uh, my question, uh, oh, first, uh, I'm Ryan, as you said, I'm, I'm a first year like Julia here at the college. Uh, my question pertains to, to leadership uh, as we go forward in trying to combat this hatred and, and violence against members of the AAPI community. Uh, uh, Ms. Young, you had a, a, some, several uh, altercations, can we say, with our, with our former president uh, when giving interviews. And my question for you is, what was so damaging about the Trump administration's leadership on Asian, anti-Asian, anti-Pacific Islander hate uh, and is the Biden administration doing enough right now uh, to offset the damage that was done over the past four years? Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it was, you know, for me, it, watching um, not only the former president, but also other administration officials continue to use the language that the own, you know, their own CDC director warned against and that the um, World Health Organization warned against. Um, I think that was the most blatant um, uh, sort of example that I can think of, of harming 
um, the community because they were told very explicitly that this could have consequences and that there could be um, misinformation that uh, members of the API community have to, you know, deal with. Um, and even though we, you know, not just myself, but other members of the press corps brought up specific examples of things that were happening and different attacks, um, you know, the uh, language did not stop. And so I always wondered um, why, and it wasn't that hard to understand because um, the Trump administration's response to the pandemic, in many ways, there were missteps and there was um, a failure in, in other ways. And so I think um, at the time, remember we were going into the election and the president was very worried that this was going to harm his chances. And so, um, you know, it, it made sense that he wanted to uh, blame someone else. And that's why we, we heard over and over him using the phrases China virus and Chinese uh, virus and Wuhan flu. And, and to be sure, you know, if the Chinese government and the CCP has played a role in the origins of the virus and, and covering it up, there must be consequences. But I think the administration failed to really separate and distinguish between that and Asian Americans and Chinese Americans. To your second question, um, the administration has taken already several actions to try to direct more resources to combating these hate crimes. Um, and, you know, obviously, as we've been talking about, words matter. And on many occasions, President Biden has condemned the language that I just mentioned. And um, I think that alone makes a difference. But they are also exploring different ways to take concrete steps. Uh, our next question is from Nick, who is a student at Harvard Kennedy School. Hello, um, thank you very much uh, for this really, really important conversation. It's an honor to, to be with you. Um, I'm Nick. I'm a second year public policy student at the Kennedy School. I'm also the co-chair of AAPI Caucus, and so I'm absolutely thrilled to, to be speaking with you. My question is kind of similar to, to Ryan's, but along uh, Wei Jazz, your, your kind of your first line of questioning regarding the Biden administration's messaging. I am extremely grateful, um, as you've talked about before, and thank you, Amanda, for your activism um, in getting this on his radar so that he addressed the anti-Asian and anti-API anti violence and calling the API community, you know, our fellow Americans. But I honestly fear the, the backlash too. I worry that when President Biden says, you know, this needs to stop and this needs to stop now, that this comes across as patronizing, almost like a Kind of like a parent speaking down to a child or like an owner speaking down to a pet and i'm i feel like i very much resonate with um amanda you calling this um kind of like the myth of sisyphus too i feel like we're damned if we do and damned if we don't especially in this truly hyper partisan polarized environment and so i wonder what your your advice would be to the biden administration to kind of balance this tension in messaging and maybe maybe kind of a little bit more like specifically amanda you talked about like you got uh, text messages from a uh, the speechwriter for President Biden. What would be your response to that speechwriter's uh, text to you about how President Biden can improve his message? If I had a magic wand, I, I agree with you. If I had a magic wand, I would have a high level member of the of both parties sit together and denounce this, okay? because I, I think it is beyond party politics, it has to be. We're all Americans. There are plenty of Republican Asians. I'm only laughing because I'm part of the Vietnamese community and many, many Vietnamese people are Republican. Um, so I, I think that would be um, an incredible moment because again, words matter, leadership matters to have um, uh, bipartisanship, uh, a statement of unity to say, this is, this is something that we are going to um, denounce, but also uh, we are taking steps to uplift and that this is beyond party politics. 
Our next question comes from Emily, who is um, an alumni. Hi, um, for some reason, I'm not allowed to turn on my video. I'm not exactly sure. Um, oh, here, now I can. That's great. Um, thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. I really admire your advocacy and your leadership in our community. Um, I have a little context before I ask my question, but um, I'm a graduate of Harvard and I graduated in 2019 and I worked at the Institute of Politics up until last Friday when I was terminated from my position. Um, two months ago, I started asking questions about labor and employment practices, sexual harassment and Title IX concerns, um, and microaggressions towards people of color and other issues at our workplace. Um, in return, my health, mental health was questioned. I was invited to take a medical leave of absence. I received a legal contract with an NDA asking me to waive my rights to sue, and I was locked out of my email by Harvard University. So this led to my termination last Friday when everyone knew that I had no healthcare plan to opt into. I, uh, I rely on Harvard University for healthcare, and I've been writing openly about my experience on Medium because no major news organization that I reached out to over the last six weeks of this happening, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, the Crimson, and the Boston Globe was willing to cover what I was experiencing while I was experiencing it, and it took me being fired for people to start listening. Um, my question for both of you is how can I and other AAPI women speak out and have our voices heard, ourselves seen, and our ideas and thoughts be taken seriously by the power brokers in our society specific to my situation? How can I make the Institute of Politics, the Kennedy School of Government, and Harvard University listen to the substance of my concerns instead of trying to silence me? Wow, Emily, I'm so sorry. Um, and I, I can hear, I, I can hear um, how much this took for you to be here to talk about this. Well, uh, what I can say is that there are people from the IOP who are listening here today, and I, I hope that they will be able to. I appreciate you letting me ask you a question. Really appreciate yeah. Um, you know, what do you have to say to them? Uh, I give the floor back to you. I don't know your specifics, so I, I'm sorry I can't help with like you know. But um, what I can do is. I, I know we have other speakers too, but how about for the next minute? Um, they're listening. Well, thank you. Well, first I will say that I really appreciate the forum team, um, Director Nanda Chitri and Kathy Park and Anon for giving me this opportunity to ask this question and to Mark Geerin and Amy Howe who have also allowed me to ask this question. I know that it takes a lot be, to let me speak my truth um, on a forum in this forum right now when I believe that Dean um, Elmendorf and perhaps even President Backhow would really appreciate it if I had not been able to ask this question, my questions. Um, I've been writing openly about my story and everything that has happened in the last six, six weeks or so on Medium. And so I guess I would say that if people find the story important and want to know more, I mean, I would ask them to read my story and to reach out because I think at the end of the day, I was trying my best particularly with situations around gender-based harassment, I was trying my best to champion student, students who don't have a voice when all of the power structures are bent set against them. They need letters of recommendation, they need to graduate, and they can't elevate their concerns and go too far without and push the status quo without fear of retaliation. And at the end of the day, that is something that I feel that um, I've had to experience. And I have, you know, I am not afraid to announce that I have filed a formal complaint with the Title IX Office and the Office of Dispute Resolution at Harvard to look into retaliation against me for raising concerns about sexual harassment. And, um, and so I guess I would say that I hope that the Office of Dispute Resolution will take and do their role in properly investigating what happened in my situation and that the discrimination and bullying policy working groups that are currently underway that recently opened for, they finally, after a month of me asking how and when will they listen to our communities, um, they have finally announced their listening sessions. Unfortunately, when I asked for them to listen to alumni and former employees and not just people who are currently employed or students of Harvard, they have yet to create substantive ways through third parties who can you know, monitor anonymous feedback systems 
I would ask that they reconsider their methods for accessing feedback and include everybody in the Harvard community, especially those who may not be under as much power because they're not current students. So to take and listen to alumni and to former employees, I think that would be really important because I think this working group is really trying to make substantive change if they are willing and able to listen to all the people who have really valuable input that they can give. But at the end of the day, we're here to see both of you. And I guess I would just say that based on what I've shared, what more can you share with me in terms of advice on how to keep furthering these issues and um, to keep moving forward and to do it with joy, like you said, Amanda, to do it with joy. Well, first of all, I love your background. And I also want to say it's incredibly brave of you, Emily. Um, and so, Thanks. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, and uh, I, I hope that Harvard has heard everything that you just said, too. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for sharing that. Um, I echo Amanda in saying I know it's not easy. Um, and uh, especially under these circumstances, extremely difficult. Um, my only additional suggestion um, other than to use the voice that you have clearly already found is to, uh, you know, to seek out those people who you view as mentors, um, who you thanked and who you, uh, you know, who you think might be able to um, relay your message. And for, frankly, just for comfort, if you're going through something, not to be afraid to, to ask for help. Um, and making sure that your, your message is being heard. So thank you for sharing that again, Emily. Um, and we are unfortunately ab about to run out of time, but I just wondered, Amanda, if you could share some closing thoughts about our conversation and about the next phase of where you think this discussion ought to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And, you know, before I do, I want to talk about uh, what it was like to be a Harvard college student. Um, and, you know, I, I think that at least from my experience, so many people joined. Um, I'll just talk about my class so that it's not a generalization. Um, but so many of my peers joined Harvard wanting to make change in the world. And then at the end, everyone went into an investment bank or consulting which is fine. If you, that is what you want to do. Um, that's great. I, I do want to say it is so, it is so possible to do what it is that you want to do. And maybe the, the path isn't clear. The pipeline isn't easy because it's not like a quick, you know, here are X amount of rounds you have to go through. Here's your summer, summer you know, internship and an offer for two years. It's not, it's not that simple. But if you are interested in being an entrepreneur, if you're interested in being a social entrepreneur, if you are um, interested in starting a social movement, um, a lot of, I saw a lot of my friends um, basically bet against themselves, right? They're like, you know what, I'm going to do, you know, these tracks for a little bit and I'm going to, um, you know, learn skills that then I can apply to my dream. Let me just say right now that you have the skills already. And if you don't, you're going to learn along the way. And it's best to learn on the job. <laughs> um, there's this quote that really uh, stuck with me. Uh, it's from one of, uh, I think, a, a Facebook um, co-founder. He said, our generation's most brilliant minds are all being spent figuring out how to get people to click on ads. And so for college students right now who are interested in public service, which clearly you are since you're here, I wanna encourage you to maybe, you know, you haven't landed that White House job yet because a political appointment circuit takes a lot of work. It's not clear. The industry is fundamentally flawed. Um, but if you wanna do it, you know, if you can do it, don't bet against yourself, go for it. If you want that job on the Hill and you know you have to work really, go for it. Um, there's never a more convenient season for you to pursue your dream. Uh, and I, I want to let you know that because now, you know, seven years out from my college um, class graduation, I'm now talking to my classmates who say, I have been at XYZ, you know, insert corporate job here and I hate it. 
And how do, how do I get into, you know, doing something that's purposeful and meaningful? And so let me just, let me just tell you right now, um, if you want to do what it is that you want to do when you're scared to, it's okay. It's okay to do it. <laughs> Plus you're young. So it's, it's also okay to have many things to, to want to do. Um, and to answer your uh, question, Ouija, um, I, I hope that where we go from here is um, a sense of realization that we can actually change our future collectively. Um, it sounds so corny, but I have passed 33 laws <laughs> um, and have done so in um, a very short amount, less than a decade. Um, and in this moment we are in for anti-Asian hate right now, I, I want people, I said this over and over again, but I want people to know that you have so much agency. Um, and if you have ideas, go out there and enact them um, because it is absolutely possible to. And, and I hope, I hope that you reach out to the API members within your community um, because it really does matter. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you all for joining us today. I wanna to turn it over now to Mark Yearn, who is the director, of course, of the Institute of Politics and say thank you once again for, for joining us in this conversation today, Mark. Well, thank you, Isha, for expertly moderating a, a really important and uh, fascinating conversation. And Amanda, what a privilege to have you back at the Institute of Politics. Thank you for the life of consequence that you're leading after leaving Harvard as an undergraduate. Um, I loved your comments about allyship and the individual power and agency that we all have um, in our responsibility, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the hate and crimes uh, towards the AAPI community and your final reflections on public service. Of course, that's the mission of the Institute of Politics. So I so appreciated your reflections. Um, and I'm uh, grateful to our colleague, Emily Brother, for her comments and appreciated uh, your reflections with her. Uh, Harvard and the Kennedy School take all these issues, uh, staff colleagues, uh, very seriously. And so we're um, in ensuring that the kind of processing and opportunities are provided to, to resolve them. Um, so with my thanks to both of you, this, this conversation was was looked forward to and certainly met our, our very important hope that we put a spotlight on these issues and had the kind of conversation and excellent student questions uh, that elucidated some of the attendant issues. Two upcoming forums that I wanna draw your attention to on Monday, April 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll have a conversation on the future of public service in the Arab American community with a celebration and observance of uh, this important Heritage Month. We'll welcome former U.S. Congresswoman and former Secretary of HHS, Donna Shalala, and Colorado State uh, Representative, Iman Judah, who will be with us in conversation with two of our students, Anand Havez, who's a junior at the college, and Lena Lofgren, who's a sophomore. And then on Tuesday, April 13th, the 2021 uh, Goldsmith Awards uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the Shorenstein Center, where Steve and uh, Engelberg, who's editor-in-chief, of course, of ProPublica, will receive that award. So we hope you join us for those upcoming forums next week. And again, with my thanks to both of you, I uh, wish everyone a good weekend, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.